Hello everyone, good evening and welcome to this Newcastle Centre for the Literary Arts at Newcastle University event with Anne Boyer. This is the third in the NCLA Spring and Summer Events programme. I will be um, introducing Anne in just a second, but before I get there, I have a bit of a plug um, about two events that are coming up in the next few weeks. Um, so these are two events that are in person, back on campus, and they're both events about the way that small press uh, publication is shaping contemporary poetry. Next week, we have an event with the Blood X Books founder, Neil Astley, in conversation with poets Manisa Alvey and John Chalice. And then the week following that, we have an event with the Nine Arches Press editor, Jane Kamein, in conversation with Bill Herbert and Jane Byrne. So for full details of those events and information on how to book, please do drop on to the NCLA website. But without any further preamble, let me please introduce Anne Boyer. Anne is a Kansas-born American poet and essayist who has, over the last decade or so, consistently experimented at the boundaries of the lyric poem, the long poem, and the memoir. She was the inaugural winner of the Cy Twombly Award for Poetry and a winner of the Pulitzer Prize uh, in, for her 2019 memoir of Cancer Treatment, The Undying, A Meditation on Modern Illness, which I think, Anne will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think has a different subtitle in the States. Um, Anne will be reading to us today from her 2015 book, Garments Against Women, which was republished in Britain in 2019 by Penguin. Um, now, for those who've read this book, we know that this is a formally mercurial and unclassifiable work of memoir, vivid prose poetry, and acute political and cultural criticism. It's a book that invites us as readers to think carefully about reading and also about writing against the a backdrop of pervasive social and economic precarity. And hopefully these are maybe some of the themes that we'll be picking up in our Q&A a little bit later. And I think has also offered to read some um, more recent poetry. Um, so we're also really fortunate uh, to be able to hear this uh, this evening. So how are things going to go? Anne's going to read to us first of all for maybe 20 or 25 minutes or so. And then we'll move into a Q&A between Anne and myself. And we'd like at the end of the session to pick up uh, any and all questions from the audience. So if you do have questions uh, that you'd like me to um, put to Anne, please put them in the YouTube channel chat. And um, by some magic, they will appear also in my own chat in Zoom here so I can pass them on to Anne. Um, but that's all from me from the moment. I'd just like again to welcome Anne and thank her for coming uh, to join us um, and pass over to you, Anne. Uh, thank you so much, Mark, and thank you to everyone at Newcastle for arranging this reading. Um, so yeah, I'm going to read from Garments Against Women today, and then hopefully I'll have time for one new poem uh, uh, at the end. Um, I haven't read from this book in a while, and uh, I'm probably going to uh, just piece through some of it uh, uh, without um, necessarily giving you the titles of each section, um, uh, but you know, ho hopefully, hopefully it will it will patchwork itself into something coherent. Um, and I also want to thank the students who came to the discussion earlier today. It was a really fantastic way to start my morning and uh, to have such a thoughtful conversation. I, I'm going to begin um, with the innocent question. Some of us write because there are problems to be solved. Sometimes there are specific smaller problems. A friend who has a job as a telephone transcriptionist for people who can't hear has had to face the problem of what to do when one party he is transcribing has sobbed. He puts the sobs in parentheses. This is the problem of what to do with the information that is feeling. Another friend, a poet, writes poems with many words in parentheses. I dream he sends me an email, which is a survey requesting information. 
I respond to his survey. And when I do, the information becomes a three-dimensional topographical map. The map is both like a bull and like America. And on it, my information has been turned into states of many colors, most shaped like Colorado, some like West Virginia. The information I provided was my feelings. So there's grief in my dreams, square, red, and with a cluster of mountains rising from it. I think of all those things conferring authority and exclude them one by one, an experiment in erasing importance. I thought there would be no better game to play than the game as set up already, the game called voice in the crowd of voices. I didn't mark a piece of paper the whole month long. I'll remove this thing, but in doing so, make it legitimate. I'm an ordinary human who likes objects too. This is the opposite of how life goes, its steady progression of scars and accolades. Monuments are interesting, mostly in how they diminish all other aspects of the landscape. Each highly perceptible thing makes something else almost imperceptible. This is matter of fact, but I've been told I'm incomprehensible. And what do you mean that noticing one thing can make the other thing disappear? The anarchist pop star had a baby with a billionaire's son. It's a gray green blur of guns and money. It was proof for those who needed it that she didn't really mean what she said. The syntactical evidence of poetry without the frame of poetry is a crime that is much more criminal, or rather if it is not in the frame of poetry, poetic syntax is evidenced mostly of having no sense. There'd be no Artaud here, or rather there is only Artaud, but not on these islands. There were seas and these were rabid seas. There were islands and these arose from the rabid seas. There were certain conventions at these times to fly, to conference, to panel, to anthologize. In other circles, it was contest, submit, or award. I'd never been granted anything. I was perfectly willing to assign to my refusal some sort of pathology. I was already sick, so what would I retrieve? Poetry was the wrong art for people who love justice. It was not like dance music. Painting is the wrong art for people who love justice. It is not like science fiction. Epics are the dance music of the people who love war. Movies are the justice of the people who love war. Information is the poetry of the people who love war. You should know this. The feed is your poem. We get only slivers of the self-directed life. At first, a pie chart, then something else. There is a brew in these rooms and apartments and duplexes and trailers and shared houses and single family houses and estates. The brew is not human, but like a bear, if a bear were a shadow and 10 times bigger than a bear. This brew like a shadow and a bear, not a human, is named survival life. The brew is always saying something, is saying, give me the labor of your body, not the work of your hands. We fall asleep in that bear's arms. My favorite arts are the ones that can move your body or make a new world. What at first kept me enthralled wasn't justice. It was justice like waves and a set of personal issues like the asceticization of politics and the limitations of reading list before the digital age. At least, at least two types of people. They are at least two types of people. The first for whom the ordinary worldliness is easy. The regular social routines and material cares are nothing too external to them and easily absorbed. 
They are not alien from the creation and maintenance of the world, and the world does not treat them as alien. And also from them, the efforts toward the world and to them, the fulfillment of the world's moderate desires flow. They are effortless at eating, moving, arranging their arms as they sit or stand, being hired, being paid, cleaning up, spending, playing, mating. They are in ease and comfort. The world is for the world and for them. Then there are those over whom the events and opportunities of this everyday world wash over. There is rarely in the second type any easy kind of absorption. There is only a visible evidence of having been made of a different substance, one that repels. Also from them, it is almost impossible to give to the world what it will welcome or reward. And how does the second type hold their arms across their chest, behind their back? And how do they find food to eat and then prepare this food? And how do they receive a check or endorse it? And what also of the difficulties of love or being loved, its expansiveness, the way it is used for markets and indentured moods? And what is the second substance? And how does it come to have as one of its qualities the resistance of the world as it is? And also, what is the person made of the second substance? Is this a human or more or less than one? Where is the true impermeable community of the second human whose arms do not easily arrange themselves and for whom the salaries and weddings and garages do not come? These are perhaps not two sorts of persons, but two kinds of fortune. The first is soft and regular. The second is a baffled kind and magnetic, magnetic only to the second substance and made itself out of a different second substance and having at its end a second and almost blank faced reward. Not writing. When I am not writing, I am not writing a novel called 1994 about a young woman in an office park in a provincial town who has a job cutting and pasting time. I am not writing a novel called Nero about the world's richest art star in space. I am not writing a book called Kansas City Spleen. I'm not writing a book of political philosophy called Questions for Poets. I'm not writing a scandalous memoir. I am not writing a pathetic memoir. I'm not writing a memoir about poetry or love. I'm not writing a memory, memoir about poverty, debt collection, or bankruptcy. I'm not writing about family court. I'm not writing a memoir because memoirs are for property owners, and I'm not writing a memoir about the prohibitions of memoirs. When I am not writing a memoir, I'm also not writing any kind of poetry, not prose poems, contemporary or otherwise, not poems made of fragments, not tightened and compressed poems, not loosened and conversational poems, not conceptual poems, not virtuosic poems employing many different types of euphonious devices, not poems with epiphanies and not poems without, not documentary poems about recent political moments, not poems heavy with allusion to critical theory and popular song. I'm not writing Leaving the Atocha Station by Ann Boyer, and certainly not writing Nadja by Ann Boyer, though would like to write Debt by Ann Boyer, though I'm not writing The German Ideology by Ann Boyer, and not writing a screenplay called Spartacus. I'm not writing an account of myself more miserable than Rousseau. I'm not writing an account of myself more innocent than Blake. I am not writing epic poetry, although I like what Milton said about lyric poets drinking wine while epic poets should drink water from a wooden bowl. I would like to drink wine from a wooden bowl or to drink water from an emptied bottle of wine. I'm not writing a book about shopping, which is a woman shopping. I'm not writing an account of my dreams, not my own, not anyone else's. 
I'm not writing anything anyone has requested of me or is waiting on, not a poetics essay or any other sort of essay, not writing prompts, not my thoughts about critical theory or popular song. I'm not writing a new constitution for the Republic of No History. I'm not writing a will or a medical report. I'm not writing Facebook status updates. I'm not writing thank you notes or apologies. I'm not writing book reviews. I'm not writing blurbs. I'm not writing about contemporary art. I'm not writing online dating profiles. I'm not writing anonymous communiques. I'm not writing textbooks. I'm not writing a history of these times or of past times or of any future times and not even the history of these visions, which are with me all day and all of the night. <laughs> these were the days when they made a great mistake about me. I felt an acute self-consciousness and could not remove the vanguard's weaknesses to relieve these spasms. I knew nothing of the long, heavy claws of pardon. The air was sick hot. The great roving gang of neighborhood toms hid out until nightfall, then wailed in chorus. I had once had morning glories. I had once had marvels of Peru. I did not stand free from desire. And somewhere between the chemical fluorescence and the primeval murk, people tried to help me. I threw out my hands. The story went on for the most part with a kind of lovely unease, spending days in bed, claiming I was a nun, painting abstracted farm scenes. I could not move from the center of the space. So I said to everyone, as if I meant it, we will leave it here. It has kind of killed me to tell you about this. The man who had once been my lover sat on a divan making anagrams out of Shakespeare's sonnets. And I was nervous about lineage and public assistance. I was half cool, but not entirely. I was poor, I was solitary, and I undertook to devote myself to literature in a community in which the interest in literature was of yet of the smallest. I believed that autodidacts were here to teach decency. I believed I'd lost my front. I kept checking the social fabric for the hole I'd burn. I dreamed someone had written a sign and says she will never return a call. I noticed the qualia of my consciousness was like redness or pain. I was certain there were elements of experience about which one could never write. I believed that if one came to poetry for solace, one was fucked. I believed things would go on like this. I then created a deep system for the perpetuation and proliferation of denial. And that system had many nodes. And in these nodes, there were rubrics for evaluation. And as one node sensed that the system was feeding power to another node, it flared and insisted that I feed power to it. I wrote so many signs saying, Anne, answer your emails, but could never do just that. But I had to end the story somewhere. I chose the moment when I fell in love. You see, I was a man who enjoyed the grandeur of buildings. You see, I was a woman who took notes. Everyone was very kind and wanted to help. But in order to be clear about it, I will tell the story like this. It appears that she refused the ladder, but in truth, she refused the rope. And finally, from this book, did I explain that those days were the days when the people wrote on machines that connected to machines that connected to machines that connected to people who wrote on machines? Those were the days when we believed in information. And I was a person in those days, but I did not believe in information. I liked to imagine the interfaces that would make the public private and make the private 
okay. Privacy was not an effect exactly of confession, which in those days was buying stock in the public company. These were the days of crude luxury and genteel sorrow. These were the days I loved to delete. There is no such thing really as the public ever again. We fractured into temperate and intemperate zones and small service colonies and into villages surrounded by walls of inoperative cars. Now we can barely remember what once formed us and the first and last thing any of us thinks about is poetry. And I did what I could. I was so lonely. I loved you. I wrote many small books using methods and forms popular and unpopular with my contemporaries. Among these books was a book of my terrors, a book of my dreams, a book of imagined things, and a book about rabbits in the yard. I wrote a book for computers with voices. I wrote a book that was a universal novel. I wrote a book for an avant-garde collective. I wrote a book of traumatic facts. I had written only one book before this time, but at last I put the point of my life to immediate use. I wrote this memoir that you are now reading. Then I wrote a book that was a history of the future in advance of itself. I wrote a book that was the story of a prostitute who writes, walks the streets of Google Earth. And I am now finishing a book. It is called The Innocent Question, or it is called Garments Against Women, or it is called This Champion Life. And then uh, this is a poem, a new poem. I'm called During the Flood. We were the doom scrolling animals, opulent wreckers of elephants, hands on our glistening cameras, suckers for the literal vestiges. I was a prophecy hooligan, yours was a swaggering, etc. He was of dubious radiance, she had a terminal tear. But we were all melters of ice caps, Lucifer's fail sons, dank little tragedies. We were all calico sea monsters, killing with protean courtesy, wild as each terrible remedy, drinking from filtering taps. Yet the best were like one with all hillbillies, hiding in faltering juniper, praising the smog-bitten shrubberies, knowing all providence temporary, leaving this world like moonlight, okay with this fading and fine with this day. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for that. And it was great to hear the, the last poem as well, the new one. And I have thoughts that I'm still processing about that. So maybe we'll get back to that in a few minutes. Um, one thing I wanted to, to ask was about the memoir as, as a genre, because I think maybe a lot of your British readers might have come to your work first through The Undying, and maybe they're going to get to the poetry um, after that. But of course, there are lots of continuities between The Undying and Garments Against Women, and one of them is this approach to the memoir. It's a very oblique approach, isn't it? It's not a straightforward approach. So I wondered what you thought about, you know, the affordances of memoir, you know, what, what can memoir do, but also you know, do you feel there are, there are problems with the memoir? Is this maybe one of the ways that you have to approach it in this oblique way that you do? And, and how, might, how might the writer just sort of approach and navigate those problems with that genre? Well, I mean, the first affordance of the memoir is like every genre, it gives a writer something to work against. Right. So it gives you it gives you uh, the walls to push against or the doors to open or the windows to open to try to escape the uh, preconceived uh, the, the limitations of the form. And um, 
when I was writing garments, what particularly struck me was that memoirs are often written from a place of resolution. That is, I had a problem, I had an adventure, I had an episode, and now I write to you from like the safety of its resolution, like, or I write to you having uh, made an accomplishment, right? I, I write to you having won life. And this to me seems patently dishonest. There's right? no way to conceive of life, which is much more contradictory and ambiguous than uh, to win at life or to lose at life. And especially in a life in which I think um, perhaps I'm more identified with my losses than my wins, but the, the not wanting to neglect uh, the full variety and truth of human experience. Uh, so not wanting to like exploit the problem merely as the thing to be overcome, but to understand the problem uh, or the event as uh, that which constitutes a larger and shared condition. Right? So this is what the memoir really, really has a hard time with, right? At the same time, um, there are experiences of our own lives that do instruct us about the nature of our shared world. And to leave those behind, or especially for me, to leave experience behind that's been sort of degraded or underestimated because it's uh, the experience of women or experience from certain kinds of uh, class positions. I didn't, I, like, I can't do that. So I had to find the resolution. So of course it was very helpful to find a place to push against like, a, a room to try to break free of um, as I write. Thanks, and I think that it makes a lot of a lot of sense in that. There's a question about <clears throat> sort of intransigence and opacity that I hope we can get back to actually that sort of that you raised already there and the idea of sort of pushing against something. Um, but that did also raise a question for me about you know this idea of um, not of avoiding sort of simplistic resolutions to the idea of identity and subjectivity, right? And finding ways to, to, to keep them open and problematic at the same time as you're sort of exploring some of the tensions in that. Mm -hmm. Do you think that applies to say the, the lyric poem as well as the memoir? Does, does the lyric have a similar sort of problem, do you think? Well, I mean, you know, Lyric poetry is, is, is a larger category and an older category than memoir. I mean, I just, I really think it is. And so, so it, you know, because it has, a, um, a, it sort of has a deeper history or a deeper set of, of text attached to it. Um, and so that becomes a kind of more complicated. I mean, I said, it's, 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 you know, poetry is, uh, an absolutely like effective method of uh, like gripping with a death grip onto ambiguity, right? Like, 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 absolutely, right? Like, fail, like, 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 uh, um, proudly failing to resolve, right? Like, instead enacting. Uh, the problems that of, of the problems, the contradictions, the paradoxes of, 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 of uh, life, right? Like poetry is glorious in its ability to stay in um, inside of uh, confused experience. Um, but one of the problems, so, so Grimmins Against Women is this really sort of stubborn refusal to write poetry, I, like as, as a poem, because I mean, a, a kind of expression of sorrow or grief or something like that, where, where I wasn't going to hold to it. And you know, one of the problems with, with poetry, sometimes when trying to write about this is that it's just so beautiful that it allows us to neglect the, to neglect the difficulty embedded therein, right? I suppose that's the problem in the gift of, of, of very traditional lyric poetry uh, is that beauty can sometimes bandage up difficulty and uh, we're never invited to walk beyond it uh, inside of the lyric poem. I mean, sometimes that's good. Sometimes that's why I go to poetry because I just want to like roll around in the, the, the beauty of it. But um it makes the task of writing about some of the things that I've been trying to write about for the course of my career uh, 
a little bit more difficult. Yeah, that, that's great. And it says you, you just read the passage in Gums Against Women as well. We, you know, you talk about the idea of solace in poetry as being, you know, a pretty troubling one in some way. Although, as you say, there might be certain moods where we feel actually that's exactly what we need. Yeah. And maybe that's fine as well sometimes. Um, another kind of question that just came to me when you were talking then is this idea of you know the lyric having this massive history behind it but I suppose the memoir does as well and Gum on Against Women is is it is a book of many voices isn't it as well as your own and we get all of these uh, allusions and references and quotations from other writers um, and so I just wondered you know how you sort of situate or ground yourself as a writer, are there certain writers that you sort of come back to time and time again, or do you think you're kind of writing into or out of a, a tradition? How do you, how do you approach that that question? Um, really yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty clear. I write as a reader. I, I mean, I think this like, what am I going to be in the day? I'm going to be a reader because I just, you know, like the 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 conversation with the far away, the conversation with the dead. This is the ongoing conversation of my life, as I suppose it is for many of us who write or just love to read. Um, you know, that the thing about garments, which is so strange, it comes out of a lot of reading and only some of it sort of makes it in and kind of what makes it in is the more uncomfortable, prickly, antagonistic reading that I was doing at the time, like the the, the uh, upsetting things that I was reading while the ground of those things, which I was more in accordance with, like lingers in the conceptual background uh, of, of the work. Um, so, for example, you know, there's like a direct address to Rousseau at the end. I think he shows up several times. It's also reading, you know, Mary Wollstonecraft. She shows up in the epigraph, but she doesn't show up again. She shows up, you know, like in my thoughts, she's like there the whole time. But in the book, uh, she's not as directly quoted. Um, you know, it's. And I mean, in that, like, and I don't really know what to say about it. I suppose it's, it's, it's again just the uh, intellectual uh, companionship of the books that that is always sort of walking through me everywhere. But if I see myself inside of a, a tradition or anything, I mean, it's it's actually the living tradition of all of these fantastic writers that I share the world with right now. Like, I mean, Lisa Robertson is this, is this obvious one that is an influence on me, but uh, people like uh, C.A. Conrad, uh, the work of Dana Ward, um, and just many, many uh, others who, who's, you know, whose living work has been there and whose presence in the world sort of continuously like inspires me to keep uh, moving forward in poetry. Um, you know, it's, it's fantastic to be alive at a time in uh, which there are so many people like doing such sort of profoundly meaningful work in in this art form. Yeah, and that's, that's a great point, isn't it? That we, you know, we often think about sort of lineages and traditions when it comes to poetic text, but actually sort of thinking horizontally is like almost more important, isn't it? And thinking about a community around a text at the time it was written as well as, you know, mm -hmm. backstory and history. Um, I was rereading one of your essays from 2009. Um, so this is in a handbook of disappointed fate and it's toward a provisional avant-garde, which is sort of this, um, it says a tongue in cheek, um, manifesto isn't it and but it's but you come up with a really interesting idea that I just wanted to raise here and, and ask you about and it's this idea that what a new avant-garde movement might do is come up with an art which and I, I quote and I'm quoting here which might find methods of delirious compensation and so we're sort of back to the idea of solace actually in consolation in a way delirious compensation for having survived the 20, 20th century will be extreme care and then you also describe it as soothing and assisting and I 
I really like this idea, but I wondered, um, you know, if you could amplify that or tell us, I don't know if your if your thinking has, has changed somewhat about this idea, because I think it's a, it's a really fascinating one. Oh, no, I mean, I, I, I'm sort of I'm sort of proud of myself for writing that back in 2009, because it, I think it does, I mean, it came out of this a period in which I was wrestling with my own relationship to avant-garde movements and the history of the avant-garde and the... Uh, the idea that uh, shock appeared to be obsolete in a capitalist media environment, which had just taken over the role of uh, shocking, uh, of violence, of uh, avert or scandalous sexuality, even of like uh, various kinds of experimental forms, right? That were once avant garde forms, were now in just the advertising. And I thought, oh, well, what is this mean right like what 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 do we in fact need and perhaps it, it isn't so much a world of uh, tearing things to pieces now but a world of trying to like sew them back up right like a, a reconstitution for our own benefit and perhaps being able to conceive of that is is in fact like the greatest act of imagination in a world so saturated with nihilism, violence, cynicism, uh, objectification and the exploitation um, of, of both our, our own species and every other species on the planet. So that's was this moment, I think what I wrote, it was actually like this moment of really sort of profound realization, like a moment of breakage for me. Um, because of course, I think like a lot of people, I was completely sort of intoxicated with avant-garde movements of the 20th century and the late 19th century. Certainly as a young person, you know, there's nothing I wanted to be more than Baudelaire. I like, there's nothing I wanted to be more than some modernist in Paris or some like, you know, 1950s, like American poet, um, preferably, you know, like the, one, the male one at Black Mountain or something like that, these were, or a language poet. I mean, I can just list all these sort of avant-garde uh, movements or types which had become, that were, had been so exciting to me. And figuring out that the historical demands of our own time demanded something else of the poetic imagination, you know, is, is sort of where that comes from. Although of course it is also supposed to be tongue in cheek. Like, you know, I hope, I hope there's a degree of like wit or whimsy to the, to the provisional avant-garde piece, but it marks, I think, you know, like a new vision I had for my work and for the world. Yeah, and I, and I suppose, you know, that there's clearly a, a, a politics of gender going on there as well, isn't it? Because, you know, we think about those early avant-garde movements and the manifestos them, themselves being so sort of obnoxiously, you know, masculine and, and violent and aggressive. We think back to like Wyndham Lewis and Blast you know, as, an, as an extreme example of that. So it's, it's a really, it's a really interesting idea. Um, Another thing that's just occurred to me, um, and, and so as we're going now to the idea that I, I said I wanted to talk about, which is this idea of transparency and opacity. So there is a, a section in um, Garments Against Women where we talk about the potential problems of a language that is sort of readily accountable and transparent, and possibly some of the virtues of, of the opposite, right? So virtues of, as you put it, um, conspiracy corners, shadows, slantwise evasion, unsaneness, negation, and under the beds. And I, I was struck when I reread this passage and, and kind of contextualizing it in, in, in the context of what's happened in America like since you published this book. So particularly the, you know, the rise of conspiracy theories and the way that's sort of dominated or come to the kind of surface in our political life. And I wondered if you thought the same in exactly the same way about sort of virtues of slantwise evasion conspiracy in a period when disinformation is sort of really kind of ramped up to our kind of public consciousness. Yeah, okay, so but here's what disinformation is. Dis disinformation is the pretense of transparency, right? It's like, oh, look, things are transparent now. Oh, look, things are exposed. The like perpetual everyday media cycle. Of, I've finally turned on the lights. You're all going to be enlightened. You will know the truth, right? The blind, it's a blinding light of the false claim to the truth that arises in the media. Um, 
if anything, I am more convinced of the value of shadows after what uh, we've been through in terms of the information landscape of the past few years, right? And uh, the the pleasure in conspiracy, so this is one of uh, uh, like an old utopian socialist foyer, uh, uh, foyer I can never say his name, right? Foyer uh, has the pleasure in perversity and the pleasure in conspiracy that if you want to get things done, you should take a little group of people and tell them it's a secret, right? <laughs> And then, of course, like the energy, the erotic drive of the secret is profoundly alluring. I mean, I, it works on me. It worked on me as a child. It, it, I'm sure it works on many people where it's like, oh, let's just have like our clandestine like effort uh, towards something. And it becomes infused with this like procreative power uh, that that uh, the transparency, the accountability of like public, uh, the so-called transparency, the so-called accountability of journalism, of public institutions, of like, internet modes which provoke endless uh, self-exposure or somehow like the gotcha exposure of other people right those don't the, those don't infuse life with pleasure and meaning in the way that like the group of three friends like planning like a secret art installation that only they know will ever be done. I mean, or or, or people in, in engaged in various kinds of political, social, artistic activities um, under the cover of shadows will. And so I think that that uh, uh, our conspiracy times are actually part of this like. Uh, uh, sick part of the thinking of exposure and of bright lights um, about the world. Um, not, that, so they say nothing about conspiracy, except that maybe sometimes it's a pleasure to find out about, um, but they say far more about the relentless need uh, for this like fluorescently lit uh, version of, of the inadequate world. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, you know be more suspicious about the obvious than the hidden is sometimes important, isn't it? Um, actually, it leads on to another uh, related question, which is the, that question of information, actually, because this is another thing that comes up, I think, in both Garments Against Women and uh, The Undying. And I think, you know, part of this is an anxiety that subjectivity in the 21st century is always or often reduced to information. And I suppose, yeah, so there's a couple of questions I have that is, you know, how literature might militate against that happening and, and how we might, you know, navigate a space in which almost all of our moves, you know, whether it's online or, or off, seem to be prone to being reduced to this sort of informatic basis. Um, yeah, I mean, in what way might our writing and maybe our reading as well, actually, I don't know if there are any ways you think that there is resistance possible to this process. Yeah, I mean, this is the most important task that people working inside of literature have right now, which is the one to uh, envision and create forms that resist the uh, metadating of every existing thing, the chopping up of complex uh, uh, relations and uh, uh, um, forms of life into digestible, profitable forms of uh, data that can just be, uh, you know, like these like little fungible uh, uh, nuggets of selfhood that uh, get sort of passed around and rearranged in a way that does not uh, suit like the richness and complexity of life, right? Like that's what we have to do. That's what literature can do, right? That's this like that's the thing that all of this. The, the geniuses working in language, this is what they have to do, is try to resist uh, that architecture of uh, subjectivity that has arrived in late capital. Um, you know, it's Lukács has this wonderful kind of image about 
this like the rationalization in, in bourgeois capitalist society, which is this like uh, micro rationalization in which we will like quantify our eyelashes, right? If this is what it comes to, but that this rationalization that creates this crust like around the, the, the sort of sphere of life in times of crisis, it breaks apart and then you can see underneath it you can see that though it's rational in a sort of small way, it's irrational in the grand scheme, right? Like once would you sort of grasp the totality of it? And that and in times of crisis, which is these sort of inevitable crises of, 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 of our current life, it breaks apart and you see this like living molten core of existence there, right? So what literature has to do is we have to, resist simply following like the path of this like encrusted like objectified like uh, uh, pseudo rationalized uh, uh, accounts of our own existence and understand like that underneath that all there's still just the, the, it, it hasn't it hasn't conquered all it cannot devour all it's actually a sort of superficial crust of like a historical period on top of something much more like grand and powerful um, than these forces right now which seem to contain it I mean actually this is just all my books are about this <laughs> so the undines about this and garments is about this and I mean if there's one thing that things are about for me it's it's this understanding of life. Thanks for that. And um, I'm just picking up a question here from Alice Brewer, who says, it's so nice to hear you read, thank you, question. How did the processes of writing Ma Vie en Bling garments as a whole compare to your next not memoir, The Undying? So how do they compare to each other in terms of the writing process? Well, the thing about garments is that this manuscript was in the drawer because I didn't think it was anything. I didn't think it was, I mean, I didn't think it was anything anybody would want. And it had come from all this sort of, a, you know, like writing in my journals and things like that. And I think, I think it was one Thanksgiving I was by myself and just like had a holiday and I put it together and then I was like oh there's no place in the world for this except for my drawer and so I'm just going to put it there and then when Asada asked me for a book I said you know Asada publishes things that that, that are are these un unidentifiable literary objects like I'm gonna uh, send this to them and see if they want it and they did um, and so I was very surprised by its success because it seemed to me very well, I don't know. I mean, it just seemed to me strange. I mean, it still seems like a strange book to me. Um, the Undying was a little bit different because the Undying, I knew I had the task of communicating my experiences during cancer to the world. I was so mad about the way people with cancer are treated and the way sick people are treated inside. So mad about capitalist medicine, so mad about the unnecessary uh, infliction of suffering on those of us who already suffer from just having bodies and being sensate and vulnerable, that it, mad too about care work and its uh, neglect and undervalue in society. And so I felt like the fire underneath me about that one, even then it took me five years. And um, so unlike something like Garments, which it's still sort of surprising to see it in the world, the Undying, I knew, cause I was, you know, was writing the journals, the, the raw materials for it while I was sick. It was like living, if I live or if I die, there will be a book at the end of this because there has to be, because there's no reason that I should, uh, have seen all of this or have lived through all of this without uh, turning it into something for other people. Um, and so there was credible like sense of internal pressure that that book had to be in the world no matter what it took um, to get it there. Thanks Anne. Um, I'm just waiting, obviously encourage anyone else in the last 10 minutes to um, send over your questions if you have any. Um, another thing which is really, so we haven't talked about this at all, but I, um, 
I, as I was reading through a handbook of disappointed fate, I, I also read your essay in the Occupy movement in Kansas City and your sort of involvement in, in the protest there. And I, I love your description of, of the crowds in Kansas City and you describe them, you compare them to the city itself and you say they were as lovely as the underhanded anti-rule of Kansas City itself. <laughs> so I immediately then thought, what, what's the relationship of the city you know, to your writing is the actual fit and you talk quite a lot about architecture in your writing generally and sort of physical space is obviously really important but what is there a relationship maybe between your sort of physical setting in Kansas City and that geographical placement and the way that you actually approach your your writing yeah I mean I, I definitely think that my writing up to this point is just profoundly influenced by living in this like gritty weird city in the middle of the country and all of the sort of like charmed and disturbing experiences that come from a place like this like a place which I, I think for years is, it was just like so interesting like so interesting it almost seemed even though it's, just, it's like it's like it, of course it's everything's always love hate right it's just, just like so interesting that you're just like hard to anticipate ever leaving because it's like that dude has a rocking chair at the bus stop like how do I leave a city where someone's sitting at a rocking chair at the bus stop I can't do it right or like you know the, these these kinds of these kinds of uh, events that happen in like a kind of middle-sized city like this uh the the uh, landscape of both like the kind of wreck and the possibility of American capitalism um you know I I suppose I mean there is some some sense in which I thought it's like well I spent so long looking for the beauty and the ugliness that perhaps I need to mo move somewhere beautiful where I can start looking for the ugliness and the beauty right? <laughs> like maybe, maybe it's time to to make a shift and and my perception but it definitely like my just general uh, fascination with and like curiosity about and adventures in the city that uh, I've lived in for the past I don't know how many years now like over a decade I mean I was here before when I was in my 20s I came back it's like that that is always just there right and I like hope that in my writing there's a sense of, um, I don't know, that sense of like admiration for like the strong parts and the messed up parts of, of the community that I live in. Thanks, Anne. Um, we're not too far off the end of the end. I think there's probably time for one more question. Um, in the new poem of yours, which I was so happy to, to hear, I am sure I heard the word okay. And I was thinking about the word okay in your writing, because actually it comes up all the time. <laughs> yeah. And it's, actually, it's, it's obviously a very sort of everyday quotidian word, but I think in your writing, it, it's, it's almost utopian. Like being okay is a big deal in your writing. And so I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about what you mean by that. Well, this is a great question and no one's ever asked me, but yeah, I do use okay a lot. I mean, I suppose because it indicates, uh, yeah, it's a different kind of utopian, right? It's like the one where things are okay, like that is that they're not uh, resolved, right? Because I just, I don't believe that as long as, I mean, I, I don't, I, as long as we're sensate, vulnerable, like living creatures, like nothing's resolved, right? But, but that uh, things aren't nearly as distressing as they sometimes are, right? Like that, that some of the distress, some of the suffering, some of the terror has eased for a moment and that uh, we are in this state of uh, equilibrium of okayness. And so it does show up. I mean, and it's also, you know, like I'm in love with words like okay and words like stuff and words like things. And I think this is this, this is bizarre Americanism. Like I was teaching Whitman about the war and he's got this uh, piece called the real war will never get in the books. And I'm like, oh, this is where it comes from, right? Like when you say like, this will never get in here or you write about things or you write about, okay, there's a kind of like insistent uh, uh, 
uh, choosing of conversational words that seems to come precisely out of um, this sort of like American poetic tradition um, that I, I must have acquired somewhere along the line too. That's great. And I, yeah, it, it absolutely is a thing that American poetry has historically been so good at doing, thinking of Whitman and William Carlson yeah. and some other people. I mean, like Frank O'Hara, there's just endless, it, 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 perhaps it would be more surprising for an American poet not to use words like, okay. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, that sort of feels like, on the subject of okay, that sort of feels like a good time to end, unless there are any other very final last minute questions. Um, but I don't see any coming in. So on that note, I'd just like to thank Anne for her really generous reading and for answering my, my questions and our questions. It's been a really, really revealing um, and interesting session. So thanks so much, Anne. Well, thank you for having me and thank you everyone for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks everyone.